Today, I'm hosting John Deasy, a great friend of mine. Uh, John uh, ran the Los Angeles uh, School District Schools. He ran, actually, he was a superintendent in many locations in the US, uh, a phenomenal educator uh, of the highest level. And he, he gave some of the best advices I ever seen to both children and educators. So, and John, uh, John Deasy. John, thank you for joining me today. <laughs> Ami, it's my pleasure. It's great to see you also. Yeah. So people don't know, but we are very, very good friends and very old friends. And I, I and I ask you to talk with me today, actually not about your recent work uh, and everything, all the amazing things you're doing, but more about your uh, your education journey. And I, I actually got to see you working. I remember. I, that's right. Right. I came to see you at work because it's like in California, because it was like so special. So the first question I always ask is like, how did you become an educator? Um, I became an educator um, a little bit by accident. Um, I was very interested in going to medical school um, and then it was very unaffordable uh, at that time in my life. And I wanted to get married. And so was working in another organization that was working with young people who were incarcerated. And I, um, after a period of time, said this feels like there could be a way for young people not to end up here if they finished high school. So I literally just went down the street and uh, was in New York. I said, I'd like to, I'd like to teach. And I had enough, you know, uh, credentials in in the sciences and they said okay and they sent me off to teach and i honestly i never looked back and i am very grateful for that interaction at that moment in time and it spent a whole career working in public education but but, but john you you went from like you, a teacher you make it too too short to be running like the la la county schools <laughs> right it's like the big, biggest county probably i don't know on earth or in the us <laughs> like uh um, yeah, Los Angeles was one of, I was a teacher and then I was a high school principal, which I very much loved. Uh, and then became a superintendent in a number of cities. Um, and one of them was Los Angeles, which was, was, at the time it was the second largest school system in America. Um, and it had about 900,000 students. And then you and I met when I was working in Stockton, a very, very impacted community. I, I was very grateful for your visit. Um, and that had about 35,000 students. So, so this path that started, it started from clearly ideology, right? That, yeah, uh, yeah. that, that, that you wanted to give a better chance for students, you know, coming from, from where you start. And you go and you, and you, you, you know, it's a school, it's a district, it's a 900,000 kids district. When I came to meet you in Stockton, it was, uh, I was amazed because like on paper, this is like one of the harshest yeah. uh, environments but what I saw there was incredible. Yeah, like, so. um, it, I think, thank you. Um, it is it is, and still remains one of the harshest environments for a young person or a family to live in. It's a very tough, tough area. Um, but I have a, an absolutely unshakable belief that if you believe in young people, I mean, and they are the center of why you're leading, um, you will inevitably do good for them if you don't let the nonsense get in the way and sometimes that nonsense is politics sometimes it's adult wants but the client is absolutely the young person and it's very simple they want to be you they want to be me they want a piece of of what we call the kind of american dream they you know they want um a living wage um, a place to live food surety uh, health care surety and that in america only happens uh, and i dare say around the world if you have a high quality education and young people are surrounded by people who believe in them and will work hard to lift them from their current circumstances and give them the tools to to have a um a really meaningful career where they give back to society so for me and i i saw it as a child as well with my educator if you have one teacher which is a role model for you oh yeah most of the time this is enough to put you on a comp Completely, and I know you've been spending. I know from Aspen actually that you moderate that uh, you know the education fellowship there. Like you've been investing huge, insane amount of time in the development of uh, educators. And uh, um, I think I think um, I think that's absolutely right. Um, that's it's two parts to your question, um, your observation. One is investing um, in education and education leaders. 
people invested in me um, and it's what you it's what we do we give back again um, this may be shocking on this video but I'm actually older than you um, at the end of the day and but my my the whole part of my career people cared invested mentored um, showed me opportunities that's what is absolutely the responsibility to do that so that's why we give that kind of time that you see and we know about both of us the second part is I want to take a little bit of exception to it takes just one teacher um we know in the research that um unfortunately um one teacher who can't do that job well where a young person either doesn't learn to read um, a young person doesn't actually learn to compute just for one year the effects last the entirety of that person's career and then if you add uh, an experience where the person does not feel seen or heard or recognized or worse, those effects last as well. Um, and, and I'm talking about some of the research that's come from people like uh, Tom Kane and Raj Shetty, um, both at Harvard uh, and at Stanford. Um, and yet that's always balanced by the powerful effect of just having one adult who believes in you and one adult who shows you how to learn um but we know that we need that is we need that every year so you need somebody to follow follow you that you will always have these things to hold on as as yeah. you grow not lose a year as you said because be, be, because you, you draw that but in the reality of the education system you we don't have them always like sadly that is true and it is very sad and it shows up downstream and um at least i, I can speak for the united states and very, very much upsettingly, the concentration of those negative forces are usually in the communities of greatest challenge. So communities of peril, um, poverty, circumstances that young people have outside of school, it's even more important that they have what you just said and what, what I just said. Um, what we call is, you know, um, kind of the notion of uh, collateral advantage young people who have advantage outside of schools. They get to go to museums, they get activities, they uh, are surrounded by other people who uh, show them you know, these opportunities uh, outside of school. When you don't have those, schooling becomes incredibly important. So if if I'm 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 trying to uh, to to kind of analyze the the situation, you you are uh, you know you have this role model and you have activities and we I've seen it like in uh, in Brie books. Sometimes it really shocks me that the schools that you actually don't expect them to excel are the most amazing. So so I saw schools that there is like a very in very special key uh, leadership figure and suddenly this school when you look at all the statistics they they are not supposed to do that they outperform uh, all the schools that have like budgets and connections and all that oh yes i'm sure you experienced it as well like yes. how, yeah. how can I, we use it so um you were talking about a phenomenon that uh, i see i see my entire career so i've seen great schools and poor schools um meaning that the the they're well run they're not well run outcomes are great outcomes are not great but i have never ever seen a great school without a great principal uh, I mean, the leadership is so extraordinary, and and it's not because they're heroic, these women and men. Um, I think there are kind of three factors that matter for a great leader. They know that the um, improvement and having high quality teaching and learning every single day is like central to the mission. Uh, it can't be an accident. It can't be like, well, we have that great math teacher. Everybody knows who she is, and we all do it as a parent, whatever it takes to get into her classroom. No, every teacher has to be that way. Number two is they know how to hire people so that when you have a great school and a great leader, you have great teachers and great support staff. And then the third is they develop a, you know, we talk about, you know, mission and culture in business. It is the same in a school. And that is an unshakable belief that you student body, you individual student on me will be successful and I will do everything it takes for you to get there. Those three things, um, rarely happen by accident so so in in other words in other ways if we take uh, an exceptional leader and they, we give them the the freedom to lead their school mm -hmm. yeah i think which most likely we will see a outperforming school 
if they have at least basic support that's fiscal. I mean, they have to be able to have materials and supplies. Um, and generally, while there's a lot of variation in the United States, we are generally a system uh, for good or worse that uh, spends money uh, on schools basically on you know per pupil count. Now there is a per pupil count in rural and very, very um, impoverished parts of America that's much lower than per pupil on very high areas. Um, but if they have the basic ability to do that and they know what good teaching and learning is and how to build that in someone, then your comment is, I am with you 100%. Can we just get out of their way and let them do the right thing? And then you see these, these kind of astonishing results for young people um, at the hands of people who are, I think they're heroes um, because you get one chance to learn to read just once. And we know the effects if you don't do that, but we also know the effects if you do do that. I, I, I totally agree that they are heroes. They are superheroes. Uh, the, Financially, the impact on society of, of those educational leaders is higher than any executive in Silicon Valley. Like, if there's, you, there's no question about that. No and, question. But, but sadly, the, you know, our environment not always see it. Uh, I, can, I can speak for Israel that I see that uh, you know, the investment that goes into, uh, in, into the right places in education is, is definitely not right. Okay, two last questions. And I mean, I just want to I want to make a quick comment. Like, I I have this astonishing um, opportunity in my life at this point, as you mentioned, where I am working in uh, a foundation that is just doing really incredible work. But it does allow us to do some work across the world and a lot of work in North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. Those things that we just talked about are true everywhere about the notion of resources, teaching, and access for young people. This, I would add this fourth little quality, which is a little bit different, it's definitely different in the US, and that is especially young girls, but young people being able to actually go to school. And you add that one in there, and then I'm with you 100%. Yeah, it's, 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 young, it's young kids that are, uh, can go to school and young, gir young girls that can stay in school. That, that's a, that's a, huge, a huge challenge that we have in developing. And, and you know, we have a little school in Sierra Leone. I can I agree more. You know, it's. Uh, it's it's truly it's truly remarkable to see what's what's going on there. Okay, two simple questions. Like <laughs> uh, nothing I, I, simple question. You no, never it, is, it is. It is. It is. It is. This is like an advice you would give to a principal or to educator as they enter the system. I'm just becoming. I'm you know, I just became like a teacher or a principal in a school, and I meet you. You know, what advice would you give? Me? To give you a couple of pieces of advice listen to your students first and foremost bring them close to you and i don't mean like listen to them in the cafeteria have students as a regular part of your advisory team young people um are th th the only reason school exists is to support them so bring them close to you um, number two is um hire the best do not settle and do not settle for letting other forces, like maybe a district or a county, tell you what teachers have to be in your school. You know how to do the best. Find a mentor. Um, people want to mentor. Like, get someone close to you to help you. And then lastly, uh, don't get me in trouble on this. I, I think principals who do the most phenomenal work um, need to um, not seek permission, but ask for forgiveness. They know what to do. Do not wait for the central organization uh, to let you do the right thing. Yeah, you're telling me this to Israeli. This is like <laughs> our, our our slogan here. But and, and and I will give you credit that I've seen you do it with the kids. I personally saw you walking as a you know a superintendent walking and and taking uh, and listening carefully to every word that uh, that the children were saying in order to learn from them. So I, I've yeah, seen you yeah. do that. Okay, same question, but about a child. I'm a child, I just entered your school. It doesn't really matter if I'm in a, a very wealthy part of the US or in a small school, you just met me. What advice would you give me? Um, be, uh, uh, it's hard. Um, first of all, it's really hard um, to be a young person. Um, and I don't think we realize just how difficult it is. I think the most important thing I would wanna say is just know that we believe in you and that you have to believe in yourself. And that even though there's a struggle, 
Um, you absolutely positively can do this. You can learn difficult things. Um, you can learn to build friendships. Um, even though sometimes things can be lonely, um, there are people who surround you who want you to be um, the amazing person that you know you can be. Um, don't compromise your dreams and hopes. They're yours and you only get one set of dream and hope, don't compromise on those. Even though there may be times where there are factors which feel like they can, might smother that dream or that hope. Um, and, then, and then the other piece is look around because there are young people your age, side by side with you, who are struggling and lonely. And if you can reach out um, and you can be um, a good peer, um, that actually catches on and people do that to others. And the last part is like, just can you just like really have a good time? There's enough stress in the world, and in your community, try to also have a good time. I love that you start by saying, "I believe in you." Yeah, you know, and and I think this is like uh, we only need people to believe in us, you know, that would be great, right? And yeah, uh, and sure. I love that the advice about uh, you know a, a joint friend of us always say to her girls when you go into a cafeteria you go to sit next to this person that sits alone. Absolutely. That's, that's like, you know, that's, uh, I, I, honestly, this is pure kindness. And if you're kind to other people, people will be kind to you. And then you you create the ecosystem of kindness. And John, I I saw you in action, not only in the education <laughs> system. And I know, I know that you, that you actually do what you're uh, preaching for. And I, well, I, have to say that I, I know that you're interviewing me, but I have to say the same thing back to you. I mean, the work, I mean, your life is so massively complicated. And quite frankly, the work you are doing is so extraordinary. And yet you have this part of your life where you too are showing at a global level that you believe in young people. So I see that as a regular part of your life as well. It and it's kind of like, you don't, you have enough on your plate <laughs> but that's what leaders do who believe in young people. There is nothing that makes me happier than sit with children yeah. that uh, and that they see that I believe in them. You know, one of my favorite stories, again, is like entering a school in India with Manoj, another one of my friends, our friends. Yeah. And there was and there was a young girl there in India and she was uh, saying, uh, asked her, like, what do you want to do when you grow up? And she said, I want to be a policewoman. And I, and I said, why not the prime minister? And I saw the wills and I saw uh -huh. that he's like, huh, I actually can be a prime minister. And, and I think this is again, yeah. you know, like when you meet people that believe in you, it, that, that, that's everything. And we are where we are because other people believed in us. hundred percent, right? right? Yeah. So, so it's our legacy to just, hang it forward and uh, etc yeah. anyway, john i know you're very busy i'm so grateful likewise for, it's great to see you uh, you know uh we, we actually need to get together in person <laughs> sooner than later <laughs> no kidding i i hope i pass across before next summer i really do i hope so i hope so john thank you very 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 much thank you ami appreciate it okay bye mm -hmm. bye